Jake Uger, Ben Manquist joins me. Furthermore, and far more interestingly, That's right. Teresa Strasser, uh, not only is she uh, on the Peter Tilden show on KBC, not only is she signing books at uh, Book Soup on Saturday at 5 o'clock, I'm not saying anything, I'm just saying, but she would be signing those books because she has a book out. All yes. right, author Teresa Strasser. Uh, the book is called Exploiting My Baby Because It's Exploiting Me. Yeah. All right. First of all, I love the title. Thank you very much. I, I, when I started writing, I was pregnant, and I got really nervous. Like, what if people think I'm exploiting my baby? So I looked the boogeyman right in the face, and uh, that domain name was available. And <laughs> ten bucks later, I had the blog Exploiting My Baby, which has now become a book. There's no more. There's no greater photo. There's no hotter photo. We just had it up there of a pregnant woman than than that photo. Oh, because, thank you. I, I, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, here's the right. here's the news. I'm not really pregnant in that photo. Nice. Oh, really? Is that why? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's funny. When I was pregnant, well, you saw me, Ben. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how your wife did, but I put on quite a few pounds, Jank. Uh -huh. I, I hear that happens. I hear that happens. Like sixty. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> right. A lot. And, and no, you look hot in that picture. It's just like the pregnancy throws you off a little bit. But it turns out you're not even pregnant, so that's perfect. You know what was weird? To be honest with you, when I was pregnant, I felt I did feel actually kind of sexy towards the end, mm. which even though I looked awful, and I did notice I got a lot of male attention, which I couldn't completely figure out. But I think there must be something evolutionary, like you're carrying a child, so you're mm. fertile. I don't know. Right. Or, you know, maybe to protect you, something. I don't know. Something. Right. Pity. And some Pity. dudes are just flat out into Pity. it. Pity. Yeah. Also, I went from having an A cup to a D cup, mm -hmm. and I've now gone back to an A cup. So it's been full circle. <laughs> well, okay. There were good times in there. There were some good times. <laughs> I had to stop on the way home from the hospital. We had to stop at this place, which is unfortunately called the pump station. They sell breastfeeding. So you've probably been there. No. I try to avoid that. I try to avoid that, as any guy should. And we had to stop on the way home a week, like with the new four-day-old baby to buy some bras. Because my boobs were just, you know, when your milk comes in, you just have like a giant rock hard. They feel and look fake. And yeah. then they go away. You, uh, first of all, I've been telling people, you know, I've spent the last two days uh, reading your book. Um, and the book is a goddamn blurb. It's like <laughs> moving Touching, funny, inspirational, except uplifting. That, that uplifting. It, but it, it is. Is it a roller coaster ride? No, <laughs> it is not. If you only buy one memoir yeah, about pregnancy, I have it here on my iPad. It turns out I, I can actually put it down. You did, but, but you can't um, put it down. No, but it's I mean, not a page turner. No, but it's so good. I mean, it's so funny, and you can't go more than a paragraph before you laugh out loud. I laughed out loud today reading it at Starbucks at a shared table. So I'm at Starbucks, I have my coffee, and I'm like, <laughs> the guy's like, what? <laughs> okay, that's got to be a great yeah. sight because yeah. first the guy turns and goes, can you believe this guy's LOLing? <laughs> right? And then he's like, he's LOLing to a pregnancy book. Yeah, totally. like, yeah that's right. And, and, and well, it is about pregnancy, but in a, it, it is more of a memoir in the sense that it, it covers that period of my life, but it is a lot about my relationship with my own mother, which was uh, troubled to say the very least. It, you're incredibly, what I was getting to, is you're, it's, it's amazingly honest. There's almost nothing that you... Are, well, that's you, why I feel like going into high... I had a weird feeling yesterday. The book was released officially yesterday, and I came home from, from work, from working the morning drive, and I cried for 45 minutes, and I just wanted to get in bed, and I couldn't figure out, because this is a huge... A after the day I got married and the day my baby was born, the day my book was... Like, that, that's a lifelong dream, but I just wanted to cry and hide, and I felt like exposed and weird, and then I realized I, when I write, I convince myself that the only person who's ever going to see these words are my, my editor, and that's it. And right. no one's ever going to read it. And now it's out, and a part of me just feels like, hopefully that means I did it right, but also it's very terrifying. Because there are things in there no Ben doesn't didn't know and no. my friends my parents didn't know my friends didn't know. No, but that's why it's a good book and that's why we like you because you got that raw honesty and we, you know uh, obviously that's appealing to a lot of people. But I tell you I know exactly what you're talking about because when we first started putting up stuff on YouTube I was like nobody's gonna and then somebody would be like oh you said that I'm like how the hell do you know I said that They're like what I watched your YouTube channel. And now, then I started feeling that way about the, the regular show, right? Oh, we put it up on YouTube, people see that, but they're not going to see the regular show, are they? And then it turns out, of course, they do. And then, yeah, I mean, I guess in a sense you feel vulnerable, right? 
Yeah. Uh, it's, even I though mean, you're the one you put that put yourself out there. That's it, exactly. I mean, I just feel as a writer, the only thing, there are much better writers. There are people who can turn a better phrase. There are people far more educated. The only thing I really have is a lack of personal boundaries and the <laughs> willingness to tell the truth, although it often makes me look really bad. But those are critical. Uh, you know, it would yeah. help if I had some, if I had gone to, you know, the Iowa Masters in Fine Arts no, program. No, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't help one bit. You, but there, it's like the pregnancy books, I imagine, those I've read. Um, but they're like, they seem, and I would guess, they're like about the joys of pregnancy. And this is about like the hemorrhoids of pregnancy. <laughs> uh, that was a blurb. Right, yeah, that's right. There's a, but it is, and it's about your hemorrhoids and about how bummed out you were when you found out you were having a boy. And when everybody is supposed to say, oh my God, it's just... I'm just happy it's a healthy happy it's baby. a healthy baby. And you were like, no, I, I, what I wanted was a girl. And then obviously you came around. Yeah, I had a period of, of mourning. There was a moment where I was in a baby boutique and it, everything girly is so, it's just, it was tutus and feathers and frill. And I think it, it, from, in, in a deeper sense, I thought I'm going to fix this mother-daughter thing that went so wrong with me because I'm going to oh. have a daughter and we're going to love each other. And it's going to be <laughs> one lifelong Manny Petty. And I just didn't understand boys, and they make fart jokes and play with ball. And I just was like, ah, oh, they wear overalls, ah. Uh. And um, it took me about two weeks to just process. And honestly, honestly, and I would never have talked about this, and I would never have written about this if it didn't change, because that's not a thing I want my son to, to think or feel or know later. But by the time he was born, I couldn't have been more psyched. And the second I held him, it sounds stupid, but the second I held him, you know, he was he was perfect. Right. A, can, can I, I'm sorry. I'm going to no. jump in for two uh, quick things there. One, uh, I told my my uh, parents already have two grandsons. Okay, and my sister was dying for a, a, a daughter, didn't get one. My parents dying for the. And so when when my wife got pregnant, uh, we did the ultrasound. We found out. Called my mom and I said, "Oh, it's going to be a boy." And she's like, oh, that's all right. You'll get him next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, we, that's so funny. There's nothing but boys in my family, my husband's family. Uh, he had a sister, unfortunately. Um, she, she died. And so the, the feeling about wanting to have a girl was there was also this sense that I want to repay this family for their loss. And there's no girls. And honestly, we got the same. We called people and they were like, oh, well, <laughs> well yeah. that's great for you anyway. So it was disappointing. Uh, to everybody around us, too, like much like what you experienced. Right, and and then the final thing I wanted to say on that is that look, it's so much healthier to be honest about it and get it out in the open because apparently my grandmother also wanted a, a girl, uh, and her first child eventually got one. My mom, right, but her first child was my uncle, was a son. She dressed them in in girls' clothes for like a couple of years. Oy. Okay, Oy. Wow. so. That's the unhealthy way of dealing with it, and I probably shouldn't have said that because I'm not Teresa, and I probably shouldn't have revealed those family secrets. But there they are. No, I mean, like, but also for the twice, I see pictures of my dad when he was six years old. He looks like a little girl. Well, they, yeah. you know what? My husband has made a ruling about the boy that he will not be in any hip Silver Lake type clothes. That mm. he doesn't want the boy wearing anything that he would ever wear. So there's a lot of sailor suits. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because my husband probably wouldn't wear one of those. You know, you, you, uh, Sarah Silverman had a book out recently, and you did a conversation with her at uh, Jew University, I believe. They like to call it the University of Judaism, but right. whatever, Jew you. Jew you. Um, and uh, <laughs> she's very... Jew you down she's, sometimes, she's, and that's what they cheer uh, at the games. Uh, and I, I think of Sarah Silverman as a, as, a, as a poor man's Teresa Strasser. And so <laughs> when you were talking to Sarah, though, and she's really honest in her books. Yeah. In her book, The too, Bedwetter, great book. But you asked her... If there's anything that was off limits, because it doesn't feel like there's anything that's off limits for her. So, was there anything you were like, I can't, that, that, that I'm not allowed to, to write about? There were a couple things. The, the, the only times I worry is when it involves my husband. Right. So You want to protect him a little yeah, bit. Yeah, because it's not his choice to reveal every single freaking thing. So, there were a few things I had to run by him. And there are a couple chapters I asked him to read, and he, he never took anything out. He, he respects that. This is just kind of what I do. My mom has not read the book yet. I'm terrified of that happening. Well, you should be. Um, <laughs> uh, I offered it to her yesterday. I said, I think you should probably, she'll be at the reading at Book Soup, so it could be incredibly Tennessee Williams awkward. Just b real quick about your mom, because there's a, you know, uh, as you both know, I'm a big Bruce Springsteen fan, and so I look for redemption everywhere. Um, and 
you know, your mom would, in your mind, uh, your mind is the correct mind, was not a nurturing mother by any stretch of the imagination. What's frustrating, she had the opportunity to be and wasn't. But then, like, you, there's, been a, there's been a renaissance, a remarkable renaissance, it seems to me, now that you've had the kid. And are you worried that when she reads your honesty about your assessment of their relationship that she's going to pack her bags and head out of town? Yeah, that was very well put. I, I do get to it a little bit in the book. You'll, yeah. you know, towards the end. Um, yeah, I'm the, I, I'm I, did, I didn't talk to her the entire time I was pregnant. We were, we've gone through many year long periods where we just don't, we take a sabbatical because our relationship's really tough. And um, she didn't really enjoy being a mother. It was a, well, I, I always joke that she should have named me and my brother Burden and Buzzkill because that's really, it was like, oh, it was the 70s and we were living in San Francisco and she wanted to go out folk dancing and go to poetry readings, but she had these kids and it just wasn't natural. She wasn't a Michael Jordan, you know, she was a Derek Fisher, as we've talked about. She was somebody who had to work at it and didn't really have a natural maternal instinct and didn't love it. And um, honestly, as a grandmother, she's everything that she was not. When she sees the baby, I can't, I, I just can't believe what I'm seeing. It's, I'm happy I live long enough to see this. Like my mother looks at the baby and genuinely says things like, he's so beautiful. I mean, that's not her. Right. Mm -hmm. So Well, you know what it is? It's that people change throughout their lives. So, you know, I used to say that I wasn't going to get married or, or have kids or whatever. And that's because I was 24-year-old Jenk, and he definitely didn't want to get married or have kids. And if I had had kids at 24, it would have been a disaster. And I might have named them Burden and Buzzkill, right? <laughs> uh, but when I had them at, at age Buzkill, <laughs> Turkish, <laughs> yeah, Turkish pronunciation. Buzkill. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, but net, when I had him at the age of 40, when I got married at 38 and had uh, my son at 40, oh, it was enormous. It's awesome, right? So now your mom's, I, I'm guessing, is at a place in her life where she's like, well, I'm not going folk dancing anymore, and this is awesome. Her life is basically, she's got a dog named Velvet. She's got nothing to do. She's retired. Her life was a little bit, I mean, she had friends, but it was a little bit empty. She moved from Vegas. She lives around the corner from me. She, the baby wakes up at 5. She comes over every morning at 5 a.m. and does the 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. shift seven days a week and watches wow. the baby. Wow. That's a great story. Jesus, it's that's a not a little turnaround. That's an enormous Because you turnaround. know what? It's not just the couch grandma that goes, oh, he's beautiful. I love him. It's the grandma that works. Right. Let me get a couple things in real quick because the title of the book, Exploiting My Baby, like you're, uh, I mean, you're milking this. That's not, it's not just a little memoir of your time of pregnancy. You want to turn this into a cash cow. Listen, I can't, I didn't want to be smelling 40 <laughs> and not have a kid in show business because nobody likes, <laughs> 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 the be, having a kid is the best PR move you can, because you know this. And obviously this is not why I had a baby, but all of a sudden you I, find out I, someone's a mom and you go, oh, she must be self-sacrificing. I don't think it's obvious, by the way. No? No. <laughs> Shoot. Uh, no, it couldn't be more work. It's the hardest thing I've ever, ever done in my life. So clearly if I was, uh, if this were a career move. So I'm, I, it's tongue in cheek. However, it's hard not to notice that there are a lot of women, your Kelly Rippas and your Tori Spellings and your Elizabeth Hasselbeck. Going back, Kathy Lee. Kathy Lee and before her, Lucille Ball. You know, the episode where Lucille Ball had a little Ricky, it essentially, the world stopped. I mean, nobody watched the inauguration of Eisenhower, Eisenhower, Eisenhower yeah. because everybody wanted to see little Ricky being born. We love celebrity moms as a culture. So when you're on the radio show, you talk about that a lot, et cetera? Or? Ironically, I find that people, uh, I know, I don't on the radio, especially where, where I work and when I do Adam Carolla's podcast, because I don't, I'm really nervous to bore people. It's like showing people too many baby pictures. One is cute, two is annoying, three, I want to kill you. <laughs> right, no, no, by the way, I do that too. Like I got it on my iPhone, right? So people ask, and I show them the first one, the second one, and then I take it away from them. But, you gotta take it. But, but you, <laughs> you get to the videos, you're because done. Because they're bored, they're it's super boring. Yeah, but you the first got, two were cute. But you do, there's something in who you wrote this for, because okay, maybe people don't want to see the baby pictures, but moms want to talk to other moms and they want to know that what they're going through, especially first-time moms during these nine months, that they're not alone. And I'm not trying to be hacky about it, but they, like, and that's part of why you did this or part of why you thought it might work, that like, hey, look, somebody, whatever, look, you're, whatever I, craziness you're feeling. Yes, I, I don't think I'm the only pregnant woman that stayed up for hours Googling all the various genetic disorders that my child could have. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that I'm not the only person that every day thought, oh my gosh, if I, if I, ate, if I didn't eat an orange or something, the baby's gonna get scurvy or it's getting, I mean, I just, I had so many worries about the baby, which is actually just a manifestation of being attached to the baby, which was the biggest, my biggest fear. 
that I would be my mom and I wouldn't be attached. Um, so the worry was actually sort of comforting in a way, but I did a lot of it and I don't think I'm the only one, but I'm pretty willing to talk about it. And, you know, after having the baby, you know, if, if this, uh, if this book sells and I write another book, which I swore I'd never do, just like having another kid, which I also swore I'd never do because they're both painful. Um, about three weeks after having the baby, there was a moment when I was sitting on my front steps and I honestly thought, when are this kid's parents coming? <laughs> Pick him up. I'm done with this. This right. is awful. I haven't slept. I don't like this. I don't know what I've gotten into. And just uh, weeping. And it wasn't postpartum depression. It was just a normal thing. And nobody tells you. And my, uh, my a very close friend of mine who you know, um, Adam Perilla's wife, Lynette, I called her crying and she goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had that happen. I remember friends would come visit and I would see them drive away out the window and be so jealous like they could leave. And this is normal, but nobody wants to tell you because motherhood is so sacred that to say something like, like that seems, you know, just... Sacrilegious. Yeah. Right. And, you know, a couple of things. It's a milder version of that. Like, I, I've been an uncle forever, right? And, then, you know, I play with my friend's kids, my sister's kids for, like, for the last 19 years, right? And I kept saying to Wendy when we brought our son home, he's staying. <laughs> like we get to keep this one. It felt weird. I felt like, like you said, that he, somebody was going to take him and go. That he was obviously somebody else's baby. Yeah. Right? And I'm like, and then it, that developed into, holy shit, he's staying for like at least 18 years. Yeah. Like there's another human being inside our house. Yeah. And and it's our overwhelming responsibility to take, take care of him. And that's huge. It's. I'll never. I feel like, and I, you know, I was high as a kite because I had a C-section. So I was high when I said this, and it's one of those things you say when you're. High that has no meaning but I remember saying to my dad you don't know anything about anything until you have a kid because the sense of responsibility for another human life is so it is so heavy and if to me when I think about it you know I would when I was pregnant I would lie in bed and I would worry what if he drinks and drives in 16 years from now <laughs> like that may or may not and, and like when the kid's 18 you think you're gonna stop worrying you will worry about that baby until the day you die Oh, of course. I mean, just ask my dad. I've been a burden on him forever. No, and totally. a bus kill. And, right, and it's an enormous kill. disappointment. And everything. I know we got to go, but like, you just, there's so many sacred cows in here that you, I mean, from like, you talk about the drugs that you can't take. And that was hard. You have to give up drinking and drugs. Right. And then the <laughs> constipation. I mean, all these things that I never want to talk about, but clearly you just have to be discussed. Well, if you get pregnant, your body, it's, it's almost like, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, like for especially a woman who's a little on in years, uh, it's pretty, it's, it, it's an endurance sport. I mean, what you, the things that your body goes through, and unfortunately a lot of them are gross. Last thing, you have things in most of the chapters about how there are women you want to punch in the face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah a, I That's got, awesome. Who? Well, there, were, there was a few categories. Mm -hmm. First of all, I, uh, great sleepers. <laughs> I really wanted to punch them because you know all know these people and they go, I can take a nap anywhere. <laughs> I'm on a roller coaster and I just put my head down. And I hate those because I was such an insomniac. You know, when I was pregnant, because I was... I you was, can't take it, you can't take anything. Can't take anything. Yeah. So you're just up and you're huge and you're suffocating, can't breathe. So I'd get violently angry at great sleepers who would brag about how easily they fall asleep. And also, uh, we want to punch people who... Um, this is a weird one, but you know how... Uh, you know, but pregnant women, sometimes you want to touch their stomach. Right. There's this big movement about, like, don't touch. And there are T-shirts, don't touch my bump. And uh, all the message boards, like pregnancy sites, they would, there would be, like, angry rants about uh, people, how dare they, you know, touch. And I wanted to punch them. Because when I see a pr giant pregnant woman, how can I not want to, like, and I'm not, like, I'm not reaching up into your vagina. <laughs> I'm just touching your... Your skin. I'm not even touching your skin. There's a t-shirt, and mm -hmm. to me, it's, it never ceases to be incredible. Like, a freaking baby is growing in your stomach, and you expect me not to touch it? <laughs> What's, What's the matter you? with you? The willingness to write about the desire to punch pregnant women in the face. Is you know, <laughs> <laughs> That's what sets Teresa apart. And by the way, just my relation to that is J.R., when he like when we talk about gaining weight or whatever, or like if we had only a couple of days to live, no, what would totally, we do? Yeah. I'm like, oh, I'd eat banana cream pie. Eat, and then he gets on the mic. He's like, well, why don't you then? Because we put on weight, ass. <laughs> yeah. Okay, because right. he's skinny and never puts on weight, is there? No, yeah. Oh, and, how dare he? I know. It's anyway. 
but I wouldn't punch Cher in the face. That would be a very bad idea. <laughs> okay. The book is Exploiting My Baby because it's exploiting me. It is awesome. Uh, if you're in L.A., Book Soup, Saturday at 5 o'clock. Are you going to be there too, Ben? I am. All right. Uh, and uh, I would never say this otherwise, but listen to KABC in the morning, the <laughs> Peter Tilden Show. It's actually not that political, the, okay. the Peter Tilden Show. It's, uh, it's more news you can use. Right. Uh, and that's, uh, that's in L.A., of course. But you can get the book anywhere. Teresa, you're awesome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you us. so much for having me.